delighted to be here today with my friend and colleague, Tenzin Choki, and we're going to have uh, a discussion. Hopefully, I'm not um, totally agreeing on everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be hard. We're, we're agreeable people. We're, agreeable. we're agreeable. <laughs> <laughs> so, as are some people here for the first time, maybe? Yeah, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Many times um, when I've uh, gone to lectures myself, and um, I like to think that uh, I won't remember um, what's being said, but I'll remember who was there. So I like to think our words are going to be important and we may actually be recording them and might have them transcribed in a book someday. But uh, we tend to forget that what's really as important is who's here with us today, you know, who's our next door door. Um, and to and, you know, say hello to each other, because um, uh, the, real, the real Dharma is going to be in our relationships with each other. Isn't that so? Yeah. <clears throat> So um, some people were fortunate to be at the workshop yesterday, and um, uh, maybe uh, putting you on the spot, maybe Tenzin can uh, give a summary of what she presented, and then we and and people can respond, and I'll respond to that. Sure. What, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, the workshop I led yesterday, that a lot of you were there, was uh, I called it managing emotions mindfully. And the branding always really gets people through the door. And if you have both the words emotions and mindful in a title, I figure, you know, that really works. And it seemed to yesterday. And so, as I mentioned, she needs a little closer. closer. Yeah. Ben, you can bend it. Yeah. There you go. How's that doing? Better? More. 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 Get brutal. More? I have a large face. It's not yeah. big enough. It's made for Rihanna. They like me. it now. Yeah, okay, go. are we good now? All right. And so I, I mentioned to the class yesterday, a number of years ago, I did a teacher training for a modality called Cultivating Emotional Balance. And this was a program that was actually requested by His Holiness the Dalai Lama as a result of a mind and life meeting. His Holiness the Dalai Lama loves meeting. You know, modern scientists, psychologists, uh, every year or two, they have a meeting on a specific topic and bring, you know, people from so, you know, so-called Western or modern science to meet with the Dalai Lama. And so he really wanted a program for dealing with disturbing emotions using Buddhist contemplative techniques, but not calling it Buddhism, just going, these are these strategies, you know, from Buddhism. But yesterday, since I was doing it here at Lion's Roar, I was able to take some information from that secular training, but in a Buddhist center, I could also bring in the Buddhist piece. And so we did that yesterday. We talked about, you know, what are emotions from sort of a modern psychological approach? How does it overlap, but not exactly with Buddhism? There isn't really a word in the Buddhist scriptures that corresponds exactly with what we think of when we think of emotions. And then we went into some strategies and some discussion. We spent a lot of the afternoon talking about anger since we just had one day and there are many emotions we can talk about. But one of the ones that people find, you know, the most problematic is, is anger. And I was mentioning, and this was kind of interesting in a Buddhist context, and several people also had the same experience when I first started studying Buddhism. I was like, oh, all anger is bad and I better not be angry and I have to suppress it at all times, like in all places. And then in studying the emotion of anger, you know, from a modern psychological standpoint, all emotions have a function. So differentiating, and one person that I was quoting yesterday said, you know, we have limited vocabulary and we have this English word anger that applies to different things. And the, when the Buddhist scriptures say, oh, any, you know, even a moment of anger destroys all kinds of virtue, some people would say that refers more to something like hatred or an intent to harm. Like, so it's something that has an intent to harm. 
but it's okay to set a boundary to remove obstacles which is the theme of anger so anyway we had a fun rich day people seem very engaged i worked them hard 9 a.m to 4 30 p.m mm. i don't know about y'all i was exhausted last <laughs> night and i think everybody who was in the workshop and then it's brave work looking at our emotions. You know, I had people really look. My friend Eve Ekman, who's one of the teachers of this modality, she says there's research, but then there's me-search. And that's even more important. Like we look at our own experience, which of course we do so much in Buddhist practice. So that was kind of a summary of what happened yesterday. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm interested in the topic, so maybe we can... Um, pick it up from there. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think the title of the talk today has something to do with how to manage uh, chaos. <laughs> what, what's the title of the talk today? Despair, Maybe. hopelessness, and chaos <laughs> in the world. Meaningful, joyful, and peaceful. We're raising the bar pretty high there. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All of those. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like to talk about, um, yeah, hopelessness. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> yes, let's talk about hopelessness and despair. Um, <laughs> there's a, um, a teacher workshop leader, um, Joanna Macy, some mm. people might know Joanna, um, she wrote a book years ago called Despair and Empowerment in the Nuclear Age, and um, I remember bringing her to Fresno to do a workshop when mm. I was in Fresno, <clears throat> and um, it struck, stuck with me that um, she was able to transform uh, the situation. We're, there's, there's a period, and maybe we're not in it now, where in the 70s or something, we were, we were worried the bombs were going to drop again. Mm. Do you remember those movies like Testament? And, in the early 80s. Yeah, it was in the early 80s. Like really early, like 81, Yeah, like, I don't know. You know we were all, terrified it was going to happen. Yeah, in you know, and yeah. Uh, and that was um, very powerful to be mm -hmm. able to acknowledge our despair. And I, I feel that there's, um, of course, you know, like Putin could press the button or something, mm -hmm. but so it's kind of still there, but um, there's a different uh, or more pervasive despair among people when I, you know, ask, do you think things are going to work out or getting mm -hmm. better? And um, I found myself even saying, well, I don't know if they're going to get better, you know, because mm -hmm. so much of the dream um, is like, well, things are getting better. But uh, we, most of the time when I'm talking to people now with uh, reversals and um, what we saw as progressive politics, mm -hmm. war in Ukraine, the environmental crisis, um, everything it feels like things that there's there's kind of a despair creeping in now now some people have always felt that kind of despair people that have been uh marginal or struggled right mm -hmm. so some of it is just white privilege like finally you know it's getting up to like oh my gosh you know i'm feeling despair too and uh, most of the planet's been feeling the despair mm -hmm. uh, so that's another thing to look at is like how can we connect and be authentic. It's kind of weird to say, but authentic in our despair. You know, how can uh, can we talk? Can we reasonably talk about things getting better, or can we really reasonably talk about things being bad? You know, so many times in my therapy practice, I'm listening to people talking about how things are bad, and maybe because I'm getting old, but more and more there seems a little bit of disconnect. You know, I, I'm hearing the emotional suffering, but I'll say I'm kind of going, actually, it's not that bad, right? You know, or we're going home to a nice house. I, I don't, I'm not meeting with unhoused people generally, you know? I mean, we have bank accounts 
it's it's really not that bad, you know, how bad is it? You know, like that. So, um, but that doesn't mean that we don't have um, some kind of real authentic despair. So I'm kind of in my existential mode today, like, what, what can we speak to what really is despairing us, not just that we're having a personal struggle or that maybe things won't work out. Is there is there another kind of despair? And I'd like to suggest for argument that that's what the Buddha talked about as samsara, mm -hmm. deep, deep despair like that. Not just that things suck or people cut you off in the freeway or, or you know, like, um, Maybe, uh, I don't know, my German isn't any good, but Weltschmerz, something like that, right? Real, mm -hmm. real kind of uh, this tiredness. So that, that's why I'm <laughs> kind of a downer, but wanted to talk about today, how to work with that. I, I'm not giving an answer right now. <laughs> <laughs> So, except, so my Buddhist training is, um, um, the, there's no, uh, there's not really a cure for complete despair. Mm -hmm. It's not an amelioration. Um, when I first met, um, one of the first times I met Trang Burmshay in 1971, what grabbed me is, um, uh, I shared some of my, um, that's when you can actually like just talk to somebody, him anyway, um, describe my problems as an 18 year old. And that's when he said, um, actually it's a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that got, you know, that, Actually, at, at the time, I was kind of pissed, like, you're not taking my suffering seriously. But of course he was. It was a lot worse than I thought even at the time. So something like that, you know. It's, you know, even, we're, we're, we, even when we're talking about our personal suffering, it's, it's, it's worse than that. But there, there seems to be that, that there seems to be some way out by admitting it's it's worse than um, our personal suffering. That that's the little catch. It's worse than our personal suffering. <clears throat> so, can we talk about? Is it possible to talk about interpersonal or group suffering? Is is kind of what interests me these days. Are we allowed to take questions in the middle? Totally. Yeah, okay. We can do whatever you okay. want. You're the we boss. Can, yeah, I, you're the boss too. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Lama, do you mean, so for, for the preliminary question, do you mean despair as a, a group emotion or a group situation? Like something that we feel or something that we're in? Well, that's a good question. I, I think it is a personal despair and there's a group despair. Uh, so, um, oddly, I, I think one of the the messages of Buddha Dharma is like, um, you know, shifted not just from personal despair, but to a group despair. And there's, there's some empowerment when we're talking about um, a collective sense of despair. Whereas usually that means things are getting worse when there's a collective sense, but actually if we we take it beyond ourselves, then um, there's some way out there. So if I were to try to put that in terms of normal English and not Buddha Dharma English, that would be something that we feel collectively or we feel individually that we should not feel as our own situation, but we should feel as though it's something that everyone experiences. Just um, normal street English. <clears throat> we all feel this. It's not just my thing, it's everyone's. Yeah, everybody's thing. got it. 
you know, everybody felt the pandemic for a while, something like that. And so I guess my, my follow up to that is that the despair isn't just that, you know, I, I can't memorize this text or I can't master this skill or, you know, I, I can't buy the, the new iPhone. It's that I'll never be able to move out of South LA. It's I'll never get out of this situation that's just completely tormenting me and affects everything that I do. It's it's something greater than just this one thing. It, it's a, a totality of circumstances, sort of. The, the, just to clarify what you're talking about. Yeah, like a totality, things. or um, you know, we never get out alone, or I'm fond of saying we'll never get. Um, there's no private enlightenment. We all think there's a private enlightenment. <laughs> Something crazy, right? So, to try to say I can build a ladder based on one little thing, one action after another, for myself or for everyone else, I can build a staircase of little actions. How does that affect the totality of the circumstances? Or the totality of the felt circumstances? How do, how do we work on things, each little thing that seems to build up to the totality of the circumstances? Rather than, you know, I mean, we can't just whitewash the whole, and I use whitewash as like painting the fence rather than, you know, color racism, right? We can't just paint it a different color to change it. There has to be something that we do one step at a time. Can we break it down into steps? Can we do handing out shoes and socks to make the totality of despair lessen? Can we lessen it bit by bit? Can we change the hue bit by bit? Or does it need to be, you know, red one day, purple the next? Um, well, let's see. I don't want to do all the talking here, but yeah, I, I would be rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, but, uh, you know, or getting that, those plates back up there. But um, I, I think what I, what I picked up from my teachers and include Joanna, you know, like we have to connect with our despair and others' despair first before we start, um, you know, rearranging the deck chairs or, or amelioration kinds of things. You know, we have to hear the despair and connect with it, and um, feel the hopelessness of it. Something like that. And then, and, and the the doing comes the. The wisdom doing comes out of that. Um, uh, kind of hopelessness, ironically, something like that. <clears throat> Someone's raising their hand. Like we have a Zoom question. Oh, we're on Zoom too. Yeah, oh you look behind you. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> we're in the Zoomverse. Hi, Lama. I guess we could put that it's person. Seema. On. Can you hear me? Hopefully a question for tens in there. <laughs> Ilama, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, like that. Can you hear me? Hey, Lama, can you hear me? I think I know who this is. <laughs> yes. Okay, I have something to report about suffering that's actually um, pretty good. It's a comment. This past week, uh, my mother is really old and she's really losing her mind. So this past week she decided that the one caregiver that I have to help me was stealing from her. And she never wanted her to come back ever again. 
because she did it, she would feel too terribly and uncomfortable that something might disappear. And so I spent a lot of time on the internet and talking to friends and going through all her stuff to make sure nothing had disappeared and pointing out to her the fact that she couldn't remember what she had and what she didn't have. And she would come back to this thing of, oh, if this woman comes again, and then you can't call her. She kept telling me, you can't call her back. You can't call her back. So finally, my mom always considers herself very realistic. So finally, I said to her, you know, there are spaces in your memory. They're beginning to show up. Those spaces result in blanks that you can't connect. That frightens you. It frightens me. It's not fun. But what happens when you feel that I'm stealing from you, that I'm abusing you, are you going to call the police? How are you going to get care? And that somehow turned the light on. And she stopped and she said, okay, I know you want to bring this woman back. I said, yes, I do, because I don't think she's stealing from you. I think you've got big blank spaces in your memory. But, you know, are you going to be comfortable? And after a long conversation, she allowed me to call her and bring her back. And that was like an immediate elevation of, you know, my suffering, thinking about what the hell was going to happen in the future, what the hell was going to happen to her mind, and my mom's fear that this woman was going to rob her blind just, just went away. So I think there are small things that do alleviate suffering. It didn't alleviate the whole world of suffering, but a small, significant part got taken care of. And I don't believe this is not going to happen again either. Hmm. Well, I have a comment, and I, I'm, I'm sure Tenson has a comment. Um, um, you know, I've, I've had the experience where I've had to let, um, you know, uh, a spouse know that their partner died by suicide. So there's despair. Mm. And then at the same time, kind of offer them like a glass of water or something. You know, so there's, there's some kind of, in the, there's some kind of connection going on there. It, it doesn't change anything from the despair side, but there's something that happens about human connection when, mm. when you know, let me get you a glass of water or some tea or something. Mm. Um, I hope that's not a trivial example, but it's just, it, it's still really terrible. Um, so that getting someone some tea or getting them somewhere comfortable to sit down or something, when you're conveying horrible news, it just, most of life feels that way, or <laughs> there's this horrible situation, and then we're, you know, saying, you know, can I get you a cup of tea, something weird like that. It's not making that situation better, but it's reestablishing a human connection for me. I don't know, it'd be interesting what you have to say. Yeah, you know, so, much, so many various things are coming up for me. And one thing is, I remember when I first started studying Buddhism and heard the first noble truth, which is often, you know, presented as, you know, there's the, it's sometimes presented as life is suffering. And the Buddha never said life is suffering. And then people think, oh, there's never any possibility of happiness ever. Well, that's a mistranslation. It's just as long as we're subject to distorted perceptions and ignorance and mental afflictions and the, you know, results of our actions, we are going to be experiencing unwanted events. That's one way of, you know, because suffering, sometimes we think, oh, it's like broken legs and heart attacks and bitter divorces. It's not just like, oh, I didn't want that thing that happened or that thing was disappointing, you know, so it's kind of more of a subtle level. 
And then as one of my friends who's a Buddhist teacher says, you know, samsara or that cycle of suffering conditioned by karma and delusions, he always says, it's a broken realm, it's not fixable, right? And so one of the things that the Buddhist practice does is shift that perspective. And for me, that was a huge relief. Like, it seems kind of a bummer, but it was like, oh, it's not like my fault that I have unwanted experiences. It's the nature of things. And then, you know, the Buddha pointed to, can we change our relationship to those things that happen? We're not going to be able to fix all of it out there. I don't, I don't speak Tibetan. I know some vo vocabulary, but there's a word you know, the word Buddhist was kind of invented by colonial British explorers, and there was no such thing. And apparently in Tibet, the word that referred to someone who's following the Buddhist path was Nangpa, which literally means inner being. So it means like looking for the sources of happiness and suffering, not by fixing all the things out there, because it's endless and it'll never happen, but by looking within and changing our relationship to what happens. You know, and yesterday I talked about equanimity. This friend of mine did his PhD research on the quality of equanimity because he found it was so overlooked in mindfulness practice and in, you know, Buddhist practice. And it's that being okay with okay when it's just okay because we're always wanting it to be amazing, you know. And like Lama says, it, just paying attention to what's in front of us and making that better in that moment. Because sometimes I think when we have an altruistic intention, we think it needs to be huge. Like Jimmy Carter like wiped out you know, dis a disease in West Africa that had to do with guinea worms. Like we can't all do that. Like it would be awesome. And, but we can pay attention to just everything and all the people that we're connected with and that's what we often overlook, and I love the way Lama's really talking about that relationship, our interconnectedness. I think a lot of times for people, you know, outside of Asian countries, North America, who are practicing Buddhism, and we take refuge in two jewels instead of three. It's Buddha and Dharma, amazing. Oh, Sangha, yeah, whatever, right? It's equal, and we don't do that. Like, we don't prioritize connection and community, and you know, everybody, all the positive psychologists, when they talk about what makes us happy, the number one is social connection. And it's so easy in our like hyper individualized world to really overlook that. And can we just do our best in every moment? Because when we look at the huge big picture, whether it's from a political stance or environmental or Buddhist stance of like, oh, it's unenlightened existence, it's not fixable so easy to fall into despair, but can you give that person a glass of water? You know, can you make somebody in your life just that very moment and just having trust in the ripple effects? And that goes back to Buddhist ideas of like cause and effect. Like our actions do have impact and not to go fall into despair that says, oh, nothing I does, you know, nothing I do matters. It's too huge, all the problems. So forget it. I'll either go into despair or denial, right? Just binge watch Netflix and like <laughs> with your six pack every night. We can do that. But it's like having that faith that even the smallest things, one of the characteristics of karma is that it expands, right? So tiny, tiny causes can lead to huge effects. And to me, like taking refuge in that and just showing up and not worrying about whether you're going to really be able to fix all the problems. Like in that moment, out of your own sense of integrity and out of your motivation to make the world around you, your tiny little sphere a better place, and then it might ripple out, you know? And to me, that's the antidote to the overwhelmingness of all the problems. And, you know, I have friends too that say, like, Lama, like, is it getting better or is it worse? You know, during like 2020 was just bad. Like there was COVID and then George Floyd was brutally murdered and then the entire West Coast was on fire and that was a lot, you know? And then this friend of mine is like, no, no, it's no different. There's always, some, you know, this isn't worse than, uh, you know, so whether you believe it is or not, but just show up because you have to, 
not because you believe that it's going to be fixed, but because there's nothing else you can do out of your own integrity, but just keep showing up with your values and enacting those in the world. And maybe it'll make a difference and maybe it won't, but it'll totally make a difference to you because you're an inner being, right? And, you know, the, the cause of your own hopefulness is that, is not worrying about the long-term outcomes, but just showing up. There was, uh, I listened to a podcast, um, Roshi Joan Halifax at the Upaya Zen Center, and she was quoting this author, Barbara Kingsolver, this well-known author who is differentiating between optimism, pessimism, and hope. And she said, pessimism is like, it's going to be a brutal winter. The harvest wasn't enough. We're all going to die, right? And then optimism is like, oh, no, I think it's going to be fine. And then hope is, let's put some potatoes in the root cellar in case we survive until the summer, you know? So it's sort of like, just do it, just in case, right? Not like going, oh, no, no, it's all good. It'll all be fine but just showing up with whatever action we can and that we can do. Like we have agency over that, you know, and, and I do believe that it has an impact because like I'm a Buddhist and I do believe the thing about our, you know, the causes we create really rippling out and expanding. So those are some of my thoughts about despair. <laughs> You're on. I just thought I'd share your quote from yesterday, savor the just okay, which was, I thought, very memorable. Yeah, yeah, I have what Bill's talking about yesterday in the workshop. We were talking about equanimity, and this friend of mine who, who did this, uh, he developed a course. He did his PhD on equanimity because he said, you know, there's a definition of mindfulness by John Kabat-Zinn that's like, present moment awareness, non-judgmental present moment awareness. And he said, so much emphasis is put on the attentional piece that not much attention is put on the non-judgmental piece. And so that kind of led him to do this research project on equanimity, which is just not being so thrown off by the ups and downs. And one of the things that my friend said in this class that he t that he taught was, if we don't get equanimity towards the neutral experiences in our life, we're living our whole life in the waiting room, just waiting for the next pleasant experience. And that really struck me like, can, and so can we savor the okay? Like, can we savor, you know, today is a beautiful day, not too hot, not too cold, maybe not over the top. We're not in like, you know, some resort, five-star resort. But when you walk down the street, can you just savor, you know, that you're healthy enough to walk down the street and it's a nice day and it's all just okay? You know, it may not be. So then we're not li living our life in the waiting room. So, yeah. So savor the okay. <laughs> I'd like to suggest that the, um, the despair and hopelessness um, and social justice go together. Mm -hmm. um, there's an aspect of dealing with one's despair and hopelessness where you become like fearless. So usually with Buddhist style of talking is usually when there's kind of some hope, um, uh, there's, there's some kind of uh, uh, watching going on or some kind of uh, need for a certain kind of result um but the when when people are kind of fearless um they're not just thinking about their own welfare so the fearlessness and the despair or the hopelessness can can go together uh, the interesting part is when when we're working with people who have what i call double double samsara they're hopeless about hopelessness <laughs> Um, or double nihilism or something, um, because there's some there's some kind of way we can work with the the non-self negative side that has its own energy. See that can you can bounce off of, 
uh, that's, that the Buddha discovered. So he discovered, well, all the energy doesn't come just from the positive side or the side of self. It also comes from the non-self side. So the, the, there's something about, there's something that happens when our, our individual sense of hope or individual despair collapses. And, um, uh, you know, we just start, um, you know, kind of helping others in a weird way. One, one of the teachers that I didn't know very well, but I liked, um, was uh, Isan Dorsey from um, Zen Center. Um, David Schneider did a nice book on him. Maybe people heard about it, Street Zen. Um, uh, Isan was a drag queen and um, IV drug user and met Suzuki Roshi at, at one point and it changed his life. But um, I believe um, in the book, uh, David recounted a story in Tommy's life when he just decided to start picking up some trash in the hate. <laughs> you know, so, which sounds like, I don't know, if, well, the hate in the 60s, like, who's going to pick up trash, right? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't been back to the hate in a while. It's probably totally gentrified at this point. But, um, <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> you know, so, but, you know, it's like, Someone's going to throw trash down again, um, mm -hmm. uh, but you know he got involved in social justice. Got involved in, of course, helping the Hartford Street Zen Center, which was working with AIDS patients at the time. It still is. So th there's there's a real connection when you talk to deep workers and social justice movements where um, they're they're surfing this edge of despair. I'm, I'm wondering if anybody's you know. Um, talk to those folks. Um, I didn't have a chance to really talk to Dolores Huerta, who came um, for a memorial ceremony that uh, for Jan Peterson a couple of years ago. Does anybody remember being, was there at the time? I, I think we've had more people in this room than ever before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, there there's an example of working with despair in a creative mm -hmm. way. Is the you know the the, the movement um, in the Central Valley and United Farm Workers and stuff like that. Um, so I, I don't know if people have had similar, but um, I'd, I'd just like to say with Lion's Roar and, and my own teaching, I, I feel totally hopeless. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You might have to unpack that a little bit. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that from an individual point of view, like that, mm. you know, not from mm. a group point of view, but mm. individually. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so I've already failed, usually, something like that. It's, it's a relief. It's a total <laughs> relief, yeah, like that. So then I can do it. I, then I feel mm. fearless about doing what I'm doing because mm. I already failed like that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite books is A Zen Failure in Japan. Anybody read that book? <laughs> Sweet, isn't it? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, something like that. Mm. So. <clears throat> Oh. We have Heather. Oh, is that kind of a hand? No, is that a Heather hand? <laughs> <laughs> um, my question, just for me personally, and I'm sure maybe other people. Put it up a little. Yeah. I said, yeah. for me, my personal experience, and then I'm sure other people experience this too, is I think I feel hope and anxiety in the same mm -hmm. feeling. Like my hope is an anxious response, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Is that normal, or mm -hmm. how do people work with that? Do you understand what I'm talking mm -hmm. about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, you know, I think about attachment to outcome, right? Like, even if hope means I'm expecting 
an outcome or waiting for an outcome or attached to an outcome, often that leads to burnout and so much disappointment. And I think the perspective that says, I'm just going to show up because it's the right thing to do. And I may never even see the outcome of my actions. There may not even be one, but I can't do anything less than that. For me, I mean, I'm just speaking from my own experience and really like all my, you know, decades of like kind of trying to do the right thing, waiting, getting disappointed, giving, oh, I'm going to give up, I'm a failure, like showing up again and then just kind of getting to this like sweet spot of just letting go of any expectation or outcome. And then the anxiety drops away and then it's energizing because you're just showing up out of your own, you know, your own I don't know, trying to manifest out of your own qualities in this way that it's almost like it's flowing out and it can't get depleted because it's just flowing from your inner life outward to to do whatever you do and not to have that expectation. I, I remember this, um, so I've been teaching, in, until COVID I was teaching in prisons for about 15 years and I remember I had like my star pupil in prison and he was like my teaching assistant and I would only, it was kind of far away from where I lived. So the Buddhist group met every week and so I could only go once a month. So I'd set him up because he'd studied a lot, like do the thing with the students like in between before I come back and you know, just had so much expectation of the student and then he got paroled and we're so excited and he gets paroled. and. You know, I couldn't pick him up because I was a Buddhist volunteer. So one of his friends who'd been paroled a couple of years before picked him up and then I met them and then we went out to lunch. And, and then he just got in trouble again. And like, like really bad, 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 bad. And I remember in that moment going, forget it, I'm not teaching in prison anymore. Like all that energy for years. And then I had to go, no, like that's my problem, that I had this expectation of this person and I feel disappointed and discouraged. And that was a real turning point for me because I really deeply felt like, well, forget it. I'm done. I'm not doing that because he didn't meet my expectation of what, you know, and he was just living his life like it had nothing to do with me. Right. And so like that you know it's so easy i think sometimes when things don't turn out the way we expect we have that anxiety about it turning out that way and then it doesn't and then that leads to the giving up but like lama says if you already accept your failure <laughs> then just keep showing up and then everything will just be a bonus like if there is some positive <laughs> outcome it'll just be like sweet bonus yeah thank you that makes a lot of sense mm. um but it's I also have this feeling like if I'm not positive and not helping, like there's that just anxiety that regardless of outcome, like I just, and maybe this is from a, like a, a parent sort of mm -hmm. deal and the hopelessness of what will happen in the future mm -hmm. just because it does look so bad. Mm -hmm. And so like I've never felt about giving up, but there's like this constant push that mm -hmm. I need to be hopeful for the kids at the very least, mm. but it's also very anxiety ridden. Mm. Mm. You're a parent. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I try to um, think that, I, you know, an anxiety level of two or three is a good thing, something like that. So, <laughs> so you may accomplish more. Um, so I, um, I'd suggest you know growing in a bigger reservoir around the anxiety, mm -hmm. rather than trying to you know eliminate the anxiety. So we have the ability to make a bigger container mm -hmm. like that. You know, so that's kind of stepping from like wanting to be an arhat to being a bodhisattva. Um, and then wanting to be a Buddha from being a Bodhisattva. So, of course, our heart, we want to be perfect, you know, like not ever get mad again or be anxious. And then, and then Bodhisattva, then we're going to use the energy of that anxiety to transform into Bodhicitta. And then, um, you know, 
then Buddha is like no more learning. Mm -hmm. So just be okay with it? Well, I, I don't think being okay with it is an option. Well, you know, in, in, in all the practices, you know, we're not saying it's okay. So, um, <laughs> like, my teacher, Geshe John, actually, you know, had a pretty fierce temper. <laughs> um, and he got into this debate with, um, like, a Taoist kind of Western Taoist student, you know, like, there's the yin and the yang, and we need... Don't we need the suffering to realize the release? Don't some people have to be wrong for others to be right? You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and he just got furious. He said, it's absolutely unnecessary. Like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, in, in that sense, you know, it's, it's never going to be like, OK. So there's always going to be some um, anxiety, mm -hmm. relatively speaking, right? It has to be. Mm -hmm. So I'm nosy. I'd always ask every teacher I've ever met, like, you know, do you ever get anxious? And, you know, when they're talking to me, they will say yes, you know? Yeah. So um, I really, like when I was studying Zen with Sasaki Roshi, I, um, he was quite fierce, but really didn't get angry very much just very, you know, kind of Zen-like. And um, one time we were standing in line to buy a ticket to go somewhere, and I said, do you ever get, <laughs> this is, took a lot of guts, do you, do you ever, like, get anxious waiting in line? You know, like, we're not going to get our ticket. And guess what he said? Yes. <laughs> of course. You know, we should be getting anxious mm -hmm. wearing a line because maybe the line would stop, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, of course we should we should be anxious. Yeah, so we want to use that as kind of a dash light or... You, you, that's very tantric. We're going to use the anxiety like that. Mm -hmm. But also, Geshe Urdon used to all the time say, how you doing? And he'd go, I'm depressed. <laughs> How can you be depressed? You're enlightened, you know. Obviously, I didn't understand enlightenment at the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's weird, but Mahamudra means don't change anything. It's really weird. It's such a radical approach. Don't change anything. Yeah. But then we try to use Mahamudra to change shit, don't we? <laughs> it sneaks in the back door, like, okay, I'm going to practice my Mahamudra and Sokchen now, and then, then finally it'll change, right, like that. I'm going to practice deep acceptance of all my emotions, so yeah. they'll go away really right. fast. <laughs> right. Like that, you know, so that, that kind of style. Yeah. So it, it's, it's that kind of, when I'm talking about hopelessness and despair, it's... it's um, thinking that the circumstances that generate compassion are, are going to go away, and they're not. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and there's a question back there, too. Yeah. Well, now this conversation's getting very juicy. <laughs> um, yeah, the... You know, the more I know people, the more they are a mess. The more I get to know myself, the parts of me that are a mess are resistant to change. The more I see the world, the more it feels like a heartbreaking mess. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, there's also a sense as I practice that none of it is real. Mm -hmm. But there's this, I'm left with this raw emotional energy and you just said not to try to change it. Okay, so I won't change it. But how can I, but what can, can I balance it? Can I try to balance that emotional energy? Or uh, channel it in, a, in some ways? Because sometimes the, 
sometimes the and just the just letting letting alone like individual emotions themselves just emotional energy mm. it's just energy mm. right it's just mm -hmm. energy mm -hmm. and that can feel very it can feel uncomfortable or raw or threatening to sort of destabilize mm. Mm. Right. so and the thing is we have to keep going because that's just the nature of reality so what so what to do with that if anything well i i think a, a dharma approach is we, we're not going to change the energy but we can use it mm -hmm. yeah so um from kind of Dzogchen kind of languaging, like um, every, everything has its place. So that, that we can we can use that energy, but usually we're 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 not we're a little bit out of balance with it. Yeah, we're not we're not we're not seeing how we can use it mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, so um, one you know. One talk I was at with uh, Dujan Rimshays, you know, he talked about the um, how to work with poison. You know, Hinayana style is um, we um, put the antidote to um, the poison, and I think you're talking about a poisonous tree, right? Mm -hmm. The story that some people probably hear know. And so you like you chop the tree down, or, or just don't go near the tree. And Mahayana style would be you, you pour hot water around the tree. It's an antidote. I think that works to destroy roots. That's what Dujan Rimshi said mm -hmm. anyway. Vajrayana style is yeah, you eat the poison. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's why the peacock has the, the you know, plumage. Mm -hmm. So it, you have to go into like, well, when teachers say eat the poison, what does that really mean? Like that. But... Um, that, that's that's why we're doing Tantra like that. Mm -hmm. So once again, it's how we relate with it mm -hmm. rather than its essence itself. Because once we start talking about essences and things existing from our own its own side, then it becomes problematic, right? Mm -hmm. If we start talking about anger from its own side or poison from its own side or despair from its own side, then we, we lose um, the fact that things are totally interconnected with each other. So of course that's the Buddhist realization is the way out of, um, ne you know, double despair is realizing interdependence. Mm -hmm. has to be, mm -hmm. or emptiness. Because then you, you, you see how it, um, you know, how it could be medicine. Mm -hmm. Like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like, the weird part is, uh, you know, like, right now at home, so um, Sabrina listens, you know, does medical stuff all day long as a nurse, right? So guess how? What's guess what's most relaxing? Reading about reading journal no. articles. No, well, almost like watching like this is uh, ER, series. Or... Yeah, like ER <laughs> or you know New Amsterdam, right? <laughs> It's really interesting, huh. you know, so it's um, because, you know, the, those kind of shows show everybody working together rather than being isolated, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and, and it's yeah. cathartic, you know, yeah. like that. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I kept hearing you say, you know, there's this raw energy and there's this raw energy. And I, I think, you know, that's the approach is just can we... You know, in, in Buddhism we say when we have a strong emotion that may be unpleasant or unwanted, not either suppressing it on the one hand or just acting it out, like just let it explode, but awareness and transformation, because there is energy there, the problematic thing is the deluded story around it. So in Buddhism we say if we can apply our wisdom to that energy, and there's a whole teaching about like transforming like Lama says, those poisons into wisdom, because then you're just taking that energy and saying, how can it manifest in a wise way instead of in this deluded way that's going to be, 
you know, harmful to myself and others and create problems, but can I take that raw energy? And a lot of it's like just physical, and it's like we don't want to suppress that. We don't want to get rid of it. That's that's kind of the energy that's going to fuel all of these actions that will benefit others if it's mixed with the wisdom. So that's like part of the practice, you know, and just kind of go, there's a gift of that raw energy. Can I enact it in a way that's wise instead of deluded and mm -hmm. destructive? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you just have to wait for wisdom to arise. Yeah, and just keep working on the practice and realize like the more, you know, everything we do, supports that like every time you know y yesterday when I was talking about the, um, the different emotions and different ways of managing emotions and it's like from the safety of the meditation cushion we just train so that then when we're in the moment we'll have a completely different default or we'll be able to bring that wisdom that we just you know generated from practice so you can't do it unless it's really habituated and that's like the word for meditation in Tibetan comes from a root that means habituation or getting used to something. So just kind of saying every practice we do supports that transformation of that energy into some wise manifestation. Yeah. Hmm. We need to share and talk with others. So the... Renunciation the... support groups. <laughs> So, <laughs> despair, despair, despair groups, support yeah. groups. Yeah, yeah. But that's what Dima, yeah, Sangha's despair support group, probably <laughs> something, like, something like that. Yeah, usually the Dharma thing, you know, that teachers go after is um, things don't exist in isolation. We don't exist in isolation, mm -hmm. and and when um, we get into that isolation piece, that's like mm -hmm. a double samsara, you know. Mm -hmm. So if if we reach out and we stay connected, then um, uh, the suffering is transformed. It, it's it's not like it becomes okay or goes away. But um, mm. so we're not we're not really ever doing it alone. We're always we're existing in relationship, because um, of course the individual self, our personal self, um, has to exist in relationship. It's not formed totally from its own side, right? Mm -hmm. Although it appears that it is, of course. But it can't be. I don't know. We have time for one more question. <laughs> I like saying that. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. you. Thank you. Good one, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I was formulating this very long, involved question in my mind, and then I think maybe I will just will distill it to what percent of Suffering despair comes from the misperceived self. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. That was easy. Yeah. Next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we agreed on yeah, that. Yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> that was easy. You went. <laughs> yeah, that's why you know we. Um, I like to mention that, of course. You know, we have to examine phenomena usually in our meditation practice, um, in our uh, sangha practice. We're examining phenomena and noticing that mm -hmm. they're coming about through causes and conditions, which is the easiest thing to examine because we all have phenomena that we can probably agree on, right? And uh, the next thing we generally examine in our training is uh, the nature of mind, right? You know, awareness itself knowing itself um but uh a lot of times it stops there and people don't examine like who's doing this mm -hmm. the nature of self which is very hard um to actually get get into focus like that you know but we have to eventually go there and um uh you know that the misperceived self is from buddhist point of view the source of of suffering Shitty things still happen, <laughs> even when we clarify the misperceived self. So from that point, um, we, you know, so we're not going to do a spiritual override, right? Mm -hmm. The Buddha still died and still had a bad back, and you know, people horrible things will happen because it's not a salvation religion, right? Yeah, good question. Yeah. 
So we're almost um, coming to the end of our usual service today. Any holdouts? <laughs> Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, it's just something that you said, you know, that we, we do our practice every day and, it, you know, hopefully it helps, you know. Um, I find, you know, I have a pretty, pretty regular practice every day, you know. Um, Sometimes I think that's something that brings up despair for me is seeing myself do the same stupid things over and over, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I still have that fear that comes up in that situation, even though I know, well, there's nothing really to fear there, you know, it's sort of a projection of my mind. And I, you know, I analyze and I meditate and, you know, um, and so maybe it's just about patience in a certain way, mm -hmm. but it's frustrating, you know, mm -hmm. it's very frustrating to feel that like, shit, look, I've been doing this with my wife for 10 years, mm -hmm. where I <laughs> am an asshole once again, or she says something I don't like, and I, ah, you know, so whatever you'd like to say about that. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> Help. I have, I have a little, you know, years ago, I, I remember really clearly, it was something I read in a book by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and it was one of his Lam Rim commentaries, I can't remember which one he said, but it was so helpful to me for just this thing because he said, we have to kind of hold two kind of views simultaneously. He goes, we have to realize that like the spiritual path is like lifetimes, right? To, to really transform fully. And we should be seeing change in our lives too. And he said, but holding both of those is really hard. He goes, it's not a quick fix. And it's not like by next Tuesday, you're never going to get angry and you're spouse ever again but he goes you know if we compare ourselves to ourselves like six months ago a year ago two years ago five years ago like incrementally am i a little bit kinder am i a little bit more patient am i a little bit more compassionate he goes if not check with your spiritual teacher something's wrong and don't expect miracles overnight and see like hold also this long-term vision of practice and that really helped me to have the patience to go like you know in the beginning i would compare myself to my teachers and it would just be like wah wah like i and just you know and then i would always just feel discouraged and like what am i even doing but if i compared myself to myself and i just go okay like for sure i'm not perfect but like voltaire said don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good it's better yeah i did show up different and sometimes it's only in retrospect like in the moment and sometimes you know it will be the next day or a week later and go oh wow in that conversation i was able to just be a lot more present and kind of patient with that person and not get cranky that's a win right and and so that that like holding both so i always kind of think of this this sort of almost like a seesaw of like yes we should be changing but not ex have such a huge expectation in the short term and realize you know that that deep transformation and it will happen it's not like oh you know only eventually and we shouldn't be seeing any like small changes so that really helped me kind of have that patience yeah you only have to miss the iceberg by a half inch, right? <laughs> we should probably end with prayers. And yeah, thank you.